quiet for y'all. <laughs> that, that's better, it's coming. So, how many of them heard what CDC, uh, CDC said this week about your mass? Anybody? Oh, okay, by a show of hands, how many of you still have, uh, have, have had your shots? So he says you had your shots. You don't need that. You don't need that. Praise the Lord. A um, couple other things uh, before we get started. Uh, make sure you silence your phone uh, so that we can hear all that Alex has to tell us this morning. And uh, I was just going to share uh, with you. Uh, my morning devotion. I thought it was very helpful. It says this comes from Romans 8. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in anger or threatened with the death? The answer is says God will always love you. And we're looking forward to Alex's message today. Everyone, please stand for our call to worship. responsive reading and follow along and join in please comes from Psalms 1 the truly happy person doesn't follow wicked advice doesn't stand on the road of sinners and doesn't sit with the disrespectful instead of doing those things these persons love the Lord's instructions and they, and they recite God's, God's instructions day and night. They are like a tree replanted by streams of water, which bears fruit at just the right time and whose leaves don't fade. Whatever they do succeeds. That's, That's not, not true for, for the wicked. wicked. They, they are, are like dust that, that the wind blows, blows away. And that's why the wicked will have no standing in the court of justice. Neither will sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The Lord is intimately acquainted with the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is destroyed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please stand for our hymn of reflection, Thy Word.
we stand for our doxology. Good morning. Good morning. Let us pray. Lord, we come here today in fellowship with one another, setting aside this time solely for you to offer your praise, our praise and worship, to hear you speak to us, to leave here shaped a little bit more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So we come humbly and quietly before you, praying. For our days of difficulty and struggle, for the times when we have been less than our best, we give you thanks that you do not turn away from us, that we are never alone. The Bible tells us that when we confess our sins, you are gracious and just to forgive us. Help us start anew. And so we pause in the silence to personally confess our sins to you now. Lord, we lift to you our church. We want Trinity Baptist Church to be a strong and vital church in our community. We want to be used by you to make a difference in the lives of others. The need to hope, acceptance, love, and compassion is great, and you are the answer to those needs. Help us to show others the way to you through our programs, through our ministries, and most of all, through our lives and example. Lord, for those who are sick, suffering, lonely, misguided, or just in need of your presence, we ask that you would touch them with your healing and with your guidance and with your peace. You have those in on our prayer list, but hear us now as people in this congregation lift out loud the names of those for whom we ask your blessings specifically today. We remember Linda Bauer's family for her loss to cancer. We continue to remember Sandy Starkey's sister, Rhonda Roberts. She is suffering from extremely high blood pressure in addition to continuing to mourn the loss of her husband, Ed. We remember two, two women residents at the retreat at Conyers who are unable to swallow due to throat problems. Lord, we also remember Mary Helen Brannon, who's going to have cataract surgery coming up this week. Lord, for the confidence and joy and hope we have because we walk daily with you, we give you thanks and praise in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, 
rising to the setting sun as love endures forever and by the grace of God we carry on as love endures forever sing praise sing praise sing praise Good morning. I'm not sure how Sai does this because there's these two hot spots on either side of this that are digging into my neck. So I don't know how he does this every, every single Sunday. Uh, today I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 23. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who is one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animal, as well as animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything unpure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you are looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along. A lot of us have heard of that scripture before, and usually the sermon follows the sheet coming down from heaven and talking about God making unclean things pure and holy. And how many of you had one of those nets in the corner of your room that had all the stuffed animals on them? Any, anybody have that growing up? 
Oh man, you guys were missing out. I love that. Setting it up was super fun because you got to pick all the animals. And that was based on that vision that Peter had. Uh, so today I have a little bit of a story to tell you. And it is the story of the things that Peter would have been thinking about in, in, in this scripture. So how many of you have been to the Renaissance Fair? Anyone in this room? We got one, we got two, three. So I went with my girlfriend to the Renaissance Fair a couple weekends ago, taking advantage of gorgeous weather like this, and it was super fun. My favorite thing about the Renaissance Fair is, of course, the turkey legs, but there's a lot of really fun things. There's jousting, there's shopping, there's singing and different performances, and they had glass blowing. So I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to see glass actually being made, but it's really fascinating. And of course, me being a sponge for knowledge, after she was done, I asked her some questions. And I asked her how she made it, how, what the history of glass was. And some of you are probably already bored just thinking about that. The history of glass, that sounds completely dull. But there's some really interesting things about it. Did you know the ancient Romans had such advanced glassmaking techniques that 2,000 years later today, we can't reproduce some of the things that they were able to make? More than not being able to reproduce them, we can't even figure out how they did it. There's some pieces of glass from ancient Rome that shouldn't really exist. They were that advanced. And it wasn't just glass, concrete. They were well known for their concrete, and we've only just begun to crack their recipe for concrete. It's almost more advanced than some things that we have today. I had the pleasure of going to ancient Rome, and I got to stand in the Colosseum. Now, if you've never heard of that, that's where the gladiators fought, and it's still standing today in the middle of downtown modern Rome, Italy, and it is enormous, and it's a testament to their ability as engineers and architects. And that's usually what we think about when we think about ancient Rome. We think about their artwork, we think about the Roman baths, the aqueducts, their hygiene, the Colosseum, their roads that still survive today, their technological advances. And we sometimes think about their republic or their empire. So up on the wall here, shortly, if you can see that, this is generally what we think of when we think about the Roman Empire. This, their, their, their empire expanded and contracted over the years, but around the time that this text was written, this is what the Roman Empire was. It stretched all the way from modern-day modern England to Egypt and the Middle East. It was a massive empire. And so like I said, I am a history buff. I am a military history buff. So I could sit here for an hour and walk you through this map and show you, oh, well, they had this battle here, but they lost here, and that was really crazy. And I could, I could spend all day talking about this, but I won't, I won't do that to you. I know we're on, we're on a time limit. So suffice it to say, they had a very, very powerful empire with an incredibly powerful military. But is that actually suffice? Will that actually suffice? So in order to understand the context that the early church and Jesus and the apostles were living in, I think we need to actually get into a little bit about how Rome ruled this vast territory. So it was a empire of laws. They had a very advanced legal system with courts, even lawyers. They had a very, very well-developed system of rules and laws, and that helped. But their main method of control was good old-fashioned fear. How many of you have seen the old Kurt Douglas movie, Spartacus? It's one of my favorites by him. It's a fantastic movie. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. And what many people don't know is that that was actually based on a true historical event. Spartacus was a Roman gladiator who led, a, the, I think, the largest slave revolt in Roman history, and they very nearly took over half of the Italian peninsula before they were finally crushed. 
and to make an example of all of these slaves who dared to revolt, they crucified several thousand of them along a 120-mile road leading to Rome. So for our context, if you left church today and went straight to Chattanooga, Tennessee, that is about 140 miles. So almost that entire way, almost driving for two hours up to Chattanooga along the road was nothing but thousands upon thousands of crucified slaves. That is what they did. And that journey would have taken weeks back in that day. That is the empire of Rome. That is what kept all of this empire in line and control. We have a cross back there. We have three crosses here. We think about them as salvation nowadays. We have almost positive connotations with the cross. But back then, that was their electric chair. That was how they kept people in line through fear. So Cornelius today in Acts 10 was not like that. He was a centurion. We good? Okay, I'm going to switch to the podium mic, which is probably better because I don't want to miss anything and forget. So Cornelius was a centurion. That is a member, a military rank. He was in charge of a hundred men in the Roman military. It was a very important and prestigious rule, or role. And centurions and Roman soldiers in general were not known for being nice. They, they didn't have the best reputation for their kind and compassionate consideration for other people. But the text today describes Cornelius a little bit differently. It describes him as a good man. It describes him as a God-fearing, devout man who is generous. He gave alms to the poor. He was kind to the Jewish community. He was a good person. And he was so good, in fact, that he will go down in history as being the very first Gentile convert to Christianity. Up until now in the story, there had been thousands and thousands of people following Christ, but they were all Jewish, or they were all connected to Jews. Cornelius was the very first truly outsider to become a Christian. And this is where reading the Bible in 2021 gives us an advantage that Peter didn't have. The Bible tells us that Cornelius was a good man. Peter didn't have Acts 10 to tell him that Cornelius was good. All he had was the word of these three men. The, sol the, the Bible says that Cornelius sent a soldier and two servants to ask Peter to come. And so Peter didn't know anything about Cornelius. He didn't know anything about these three men. They could have showed up at his door. Imagine a soldier and two servants showing up at your door and saying, our master, he's a good guy and he wants to talk to you. And then add to that, Jesus, the leader of this new faith, was just crucified by the Romans. So here you have a Roman soldier asking you to come to see his master, Oh, and by the way, just thinking about it, your, your leader was just executed by the state. That, that, that's terrifying, if you really sit and think about it. But verse 20 tells us that God told Peter to go. So Peter was going to go. But a couple chapters earlier in Acts, Stephen became the first martyr of the Christian faith. He was stoned to death. And so we like to think that God won't take you anywhere dangerous, but... That's not always the case. And that would have been very conscious in Peter's mind. That possibly one of his friends had just been killed following God. And here's God telling me to go to this Roman soldier who I don't know anything about. And they have already started to be hostile towards Christians. That was a very, very scary situation. But Peter was brave. And out of that bravery and his faith and trust in God, he went. So I want to pause the story of Peter for just a second and talk about 50 years into the future. So it's hard to see because it's blurry, but up on the northern coast of modern-day Turkey, there's a province called Bithynia. Bithynia, Rome had 
in this vast territory, Rome divided all of its place, all of the territory up into, into provinces that were each ruled by a governor. And there was a gentleman named Pliny the Younger, who was the governor of Bithynia in about 110 AD. And he had a problem. See, the early church was starting to really take off and spread by this point. It was gaining ground very quickly because it was so appealing to so many people. But Christianity is a monotheistic religion. We believe in one God. And not only do we only believe in one God, we are not supposed to have any other gods. Rome, however, was a polytheistic state. They had many gods, including the emperor. The emperor was worshipped as a god. And so here you have a polytheistic state religion that deifies the head of state, combined with an incredibly powerful army, and they like keeping total authority through very brutal means. And you have a religion that didn't encourage disobedience at, by any stretch, but Christians weren't going to worship the emperor. They just weren't going to do it. And that was resistance. And so you can see where I'm going with this. And so Pliny had a problem. He didn't know what to do with these Christians because they weren't being awful, but they also weren't following the rules. So he wrote to the emperor. The emperor was the final authority on Roman law. And so he wrote to the emperor and asked him, what do we do with these Christians? And this is actually the very first historical document outside of the Bible that mentions the early church and early Christians. It's not very long, but I'm only going to read a couple sections from it. If you, do, if you are interested in reading more, I highly recommend it. It's, really, it's, it's, it's a really interesting look at what's going on. But here is the letter from Pliny the Younger to Emperor Trajan. I have never before participated in trials of Christians, so I do not know what offenses are to be punished or investigated, or to what extent. Is the name itself to be punished, even without offenses, or only the offenses perpetrated in connection with the name? In the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have followed the following procedure. I have interrogated them as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and third time, threatening with them with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. For I have no doubt that whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy surely deserve to be punished. They asserted that the sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsively a hymn to Christ as to a God and to bind themselves by oath, not to do some crime, but not to commit fraud theft or adultery, not falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return a trust when called upon to do so. When this was over, it was their custom to depart and to assemble again, partake of food. Accordingly, I judged it all the more necessary to find out what the truth was by torturing two female slaves who were called deaconesses. But I discovered nothing else but depraved, excessive superstition. I therefore postponed the investigation and hastened to consult, to, to consult you for the matter seemed to me to warrant consulting you, especially because of the number involved. For many persons of every age, every rank, and also of both sexes are and will be endangered. For the contagion of this superstition has spread not only to the cities, but also to the villages and farms. But it seems possible to check and cure it. Hindsight is 2020, and we know that it was, in fact, not possible to check and cure the contagion of Christianity. But this letter is really interesting. These are the crimes that he mentioned were deserving of death, stubbornness, obstinacy. They met together and committed to not commit adultery or to steal or to defraud people, and then they ate together. Oh, man. Those were some just hardcore people back in the day. Whew, clearly that was deserving of death. And this, again, is this whole letter is because he didn't know what to do. So torturing people and executing them for stubbornness are what the Romans did when they didn't know what to do. He's writing this letter because he's confused. I don't know what to do. Maybe they're fine. Maybe they're not. But we should kill them anyways just because they're being stubborn and not following the rules. That was Rome. So I want to take a section 
or a second to emphasize one sentence in particular that stood out to me in all of this. Accordingly, I judged it all the more necessary to find out what the truth was by torturing two female slaves who were called deaconesses. Mother's Day was last Sunday, and I want to take the time to recognize these two unnamed mothers of the faith. Maybe they were actual mothers. We don't know. This is the only sentence in all of history that mentions these two women. So we know nothing else about them. But whether or not they actually had children of their own, they were mothers of our faith. Now there's a lot, a lot to unpack in this sentence, but I want to start with one thing in particular. It says that they were deaconesses. They were female deacons. They were leaders of the church of their time. In our world today, there is a, lot, a debate going on that has recently flared up in particular around the SBC about the ordination of female leaders. And there are many Christian groups that don't think it is appropriate. The Bible says not to. So clearly, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's it. Getting aside that the Bible may not actually say that, that's a conversation for another day. But there is a debate, and we all know that that debate exists. This sentence right here is a giant rebuke to that entire debate. They were deaconesses. They were female deacons, and they were so important in the church that they were singled out for torture and probably execution to find out what is going on. They were heroes of the faith. And a month ago, I had never even heard of them, but they were willing to follow God even to the point of torture and probably death. Now, there's a lot more to say about them. They were slaves, and they were leaders of the church. They were female slaves, and they were leaders of the church. There's so much to unpack in just this one sentence. But the point I really want to emphasize is their bravery. Them and the other unnamed Christians in this section who were executed for their faith. That took a kind of bravery that I personally don't know that I have. I would like to think that I do but I don't know, and I really hope I never have to find out. But that is the world that Peter lives in. So let's jump back to Peter, and you have a Roman centurion, a military leader, who's summoning Peter to his house. All of those things would have been going through Peter's mind. All of those things would have been things that he would have been concerned about when approached by a soldier and said, hey, come talk to my boss. It could have been a trap. Even if it wasn't a trap, if Peter got there and talked to Cornelius and he didn't like what Peter had to say, Cornelius could have easily had Peter executed or tortured. It happened all the time. And even, that, that's one side of the issue. The other side of the issue is that the Jewish Christians could have done not the same things, of course, but they would not have looked kindly on this. Cornelius was a Gentile. He was an outsider. He was an unclean, filthy outsider. And he was a soldier. He was a military officer in the regime that was currently oppressing and brutalizing their people. And Peter not only went to his house and associated with him, but he ate with him. He stayed in their home and talked to them. If they were southern ladies, they would be clutching their pearls because of the scandal that was going on. We don't really have a context in the modern world that is, is the same as this, but imagine in the 1950s, in the height of the Red Scare, if a good, God-fearing American patriot went to the home of a Russian communist and befriended him. People would probably have called Peter a traitor. He easily could have been ostracized or even banished from the community for this act. So he was caught between a rock and a hard place. Cornelius could endanger him. His fellow Jewish Christians would be furious at him. But he went because God told him to. And that took bravery. 
And from that bravery, we have a beautiful story of salvation. This is the first example of the message of Christ breaking out into the Gentile world. We are all in this building today or online watching and worshiping God because of the bravery of Peter in this one example. Now, thankfully, God doesn't call most Christians to their deaths. Most Christians aren't going to be arrested and tortured for Christ. Most Christians aren't persecuted for their faith. But it absolutely still happens in the world today. There are some countries today where being a Christian is as dangerous as it was 2,000 years ago under Pliny's leadership. But thankfully, that's not what most of us are called to do. But being a Christian still takes bravery. So show of hands, how many of you have been called to do something that made you uncomfortable? How many of you have been called by God out of your comfort zone? How many have you have been called by God to do something that scared you, made you uncomfortable? To do something that you didn't know what was going to happen, and it could have gone badly. If we're actually following God, every one of us should have our hands up. Because obedience to God is scary. Because God demands vulnerability. Loving people who could hurt us. Giving part of our money to God when there could be an accident that we would need that money for. Leaving a job that gives us financial security and going somewhere new. Packing up your entire life and moving overseas. The last one is personal for me, of course, because my family were missionaries. We left everything and literally followed the Macedonian call to Macedonia. And to be honest with you, if we knew what that would cost our family, we might not have gone. We were terrified. I was a little six-year-old boy and I was scared. My sister was 11 and she was mad at having to leave her friends and she was also scared. I am almost the age that my parents were when we went overseas and I can't imagine myself with two children packing up everything and going over to a new country that we had never been before. And almost immediately after we got there, we got caught in the middle of a civil war. We have been in the middle of multiple wars. We have been evacuated multiple times. We have been refugees without a home for months. We were scared, but we followed God. And from our bravery and from our ability to trust in God, we had incredible experiences that I would never have had before. We have made such an impact on so many people's lives over there that may never have happened if we hadn't gone. We have changed lives. We have saved lives. We have put in, planted seeds in a community over there that will blossom for years to come because of our willingness to follow God. So my message for you today is this. Be brave. If God is placing something on your heart that you are unsure about, be brave. If you are hesitating to do something because you are afraid, be brave. If God asks you to do something that is going to be scary, be brave. Because just like with Peter, God can use us in ways that none of us can even begin to imagine if we trust in him. I like to think that those unnamed deaconesses from the days of Pliny are looking down at us today with a smile because we can take strength from their example. Some might be asking, what did following God do for them? They were tortured and probably executed. What, where did their bravery take them? Well, today, it took them 1,900 years into the future, into this room, to be placed on all of your hearts, on all of our hearts. It is a scary world out there, and to not have control of our lives and our future is a terrifying thought. But if we can be brave and have faith in the love and power of God, then we can move mountains. And at the very least, we can change the lives of those around us. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for these beautiful people in this beautiful church. Thank you for helping us all to follow you. Help us to be brave. Help us to trust you. And help us to follow you wherever that goes. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.